Hey everyone, and welcome back to It Had To Be Said Theater. This week we're examining one of my favorite movies of all time, 1996's The Great White Hype. It's about a boxing promoter, played by the legendary Samuel L. Jackson, whose revenues are down because, he says, people don't want to pay to watch two black guys beat each other up anymore. So he finds a white guy who can at least appear to pose some competition for the champ in order to get people to care about boxing again and cough up their money. On the surface, the movie seems to be about racism. How racism was still relevant in the US in the 90s, despite everyone officially pretending it was over. But in the movie, like in the real world, racism turns out to be just a tool in the hands of people who want to maintain their own power. The point of this video is to teach about how individuals wield power so you can protect yourself. And entertainment. I could rewatch this movie a thousand times for Samuel L. Jackson alone. It is hands down my favorite performance by him. and. That's saying a lot. In addition to Samuel L., this movie has Damon Wayans, Cheech, John Lovitz, Ian Malcolm, a young Ray Charles, and even Sykes' dad plays a small role. We'll get to some of them, but for now, let's go back to Samuel L. He's clearly meant to portray Don King, but he takes it to a whole other level. He calls himself the Reverend Sultan. We'll, we'll call him the Rev. He dresses in gold, wears a turban, and carries a cane he doesn't need. He looks like money, and his name suggests power. In fact, by naming himself both Reverend and Sultan, he's playing both Christian and Muslim sides of the fence. Unsurprisingly, he throws in a little civic nationalism. Glory be to God, all praises do Allah. God bless America. I'm assuming you either haven't seen the movie or so, saw it so long ago that you won't remember it, so no spoilers. You'll see bits from the movie in this video, but I'm not really giving away much of the plot. I don't want to give it away. I want you to watch it. When you watch it, if you understand that power is the central theme of this movie, you'll see it in most of the scenes. You'll see how power is wielded to maintain a life of privilege and luxury, how it's used to shape people's perceptions, to trick, manipulate, and punish people, how it rewards and buys influence, how it co-opts or neuters any opposition or rivals for power, and, as you'll see right from scene one, how at its root, power is backed up by violence. But the Rev rarely needs to resort to violence. He understands and wields power as effectively as anyone in Game of Thrones, just in a different context. He's got money, influence, and charm. He can be calm, friendly, or intimidating, as the situation calls for. He's always saying, I love you, and my brother, even to the white guy. But he knows that's just how you lull people to sleep. It runs dry pretty fast if you're used to it. Ow, I love you! Wait a minute, that's the third I love you. Am I getting jerked again? You're my brother! I know I'm your brother, but am I getting fucked again? I love you. Artemis, am I getting jerked? He's your brother. Saul. He loves you. I love you. Yo, forget this, man. So the Rev has to confuse and trick the champ, so he calms down and listens. It's easy to think the central theme of the Great White Hype is racism. The story revolves around a heavyweight boxing champion, played by Damon Wayans, in a role slightly reminiscent of Mike Tyson, I think, who's become so good, no one wants to pay to see his fights anymore. The Rev solves the problem of falling ticket sales by finding a white guy to challenge the champ. The Rev uses racism to whip up interest in the fight and sell tickets. Not a vicious racism, but more of a subtle, competitive version that's easy to deny. Is racism driving this fight? I don't think so. 
His strategy works. White and black Americans become divided on which fighter they support. Two dollars on Irish Terry. And all are inflamed with the excitement of their side beating the other. The theme of racism is reasonably well explored for an average-length comedy that doesn't preach to you. It's not treated as a simple division between black and white or whatever other color. We see how clever people use racism as a tool to blind others and then lead them in a certain direction. When the champ hears the Rev's plan, he counters, It ain't about race. It's about boxing. <laughs> Divisions among black people are touched on here and there, as when the champ says, White heavyweight? Man, the two words don't even go together. It's like saying black unity. And the challenger gets named Irish Terry Conklin, even though he's not Irish, because... It's boxing, it just means you're white. But to end our search for themes there is to miss the point of this movie. Racism is a tool to divide people and motivate them. But motivate them to do what? Divide and conquer is an age-old strategy for getting people to do what you want, and it works. The people fork over their money in return for the thrill of competition. I can't help thinking arbitrarily dividing the masses is a story that, though or perhaps because it's so common as to be essential to modern-day political power, is not clear enough to people. People don't realize how divided they are. They're unaware of how these divisions sap their empathy, break up their community, and make the prospect of solidarity in the face of power harder. They compete with each other in ways ranging from supposedly harmless sports to total war, fighting each other when they should be uniting to, metaphorically, guillotine their kings and banish the aristocracy. Power is always at risk. People are always trying to take power from you, and the more you have, the more you have to lose. Power is certainly a means to an end as it leads to more of the luxuries in life, including people surrounding you willing to kill to protect you, but it becomes an end in itself. Powerful people constantly pursue and expand their influence. It's their 24-hour job. They often become paranoid, so even if their power is secure, they could feel the need to lop off a few heads for good measure. They may find ways to imprison, kill, or otherwise incapacitate more of their enemies. They may find ways to enlarge their armies, bring in more gold, build more castles, or force more peasants into servitude. They might do all those things on the same day. There are a few ways of gaining and maintaining power. You could head up a government, you could start a cult, but most just start a corporation. A corporation is designed to make money and to give the people the power over that money to the people at the top of the corporation. A corporation is a number of people working to enrich and defend the people who own it. Naturally, the powerful have the best lawyers and the best lawyers write up the best contracts. How are the contracts? I had them reviewed by my entire staff. Nobody understands anything. Good. I think it's our finest work. Any interpretation would lead to endless litigation. These contracts are vague, indecipherable, and best of all, they're written in stone. I love you. Don't you start that. As I talked about in my video on legitimacy, thanks to propaganda, everything done within the law is considered legitimate, even if it screws other people over, and everything done outside the law is wrong, whatever it is. When the champ feels cheated out of the money he was supposedly promised, he wants to sue. But how does one guy sue a corporation for breach of an inscrutable contract? I got a guaranteed contract for $10 million. Have you read it? I don't need to read it. I sue your ass. Sue his sue ass, ass champ. Sue him for everything. Sue me. Sue him. Sue him. <laughs> I love you. He doesn't. He complies with it. The Rev doesn't just make money off boxers and protect himself from liability, but is so influential, he even owns the people who do the ranking. 
After the Rev and his employees find the white guy they call the Great White Hope, but whom we'll call Terry, Cheech, sorry, Julio Escobar, the president of World Boxing International, points out how difficult it would be to rank this former amateur fighter in the top 10 heavyweight contenders. But even I cannot rank a fighter who has never had a professional fight. But if you already have power, one person's reluctance is no big deal. Now what's it gonna take for you to make this happen, huh? I'll do it. Money? No. Sex? Drugs? Power? <laughs> yeah, power. That's why, well, yeah, power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're fired. Okay. Money, sex, and drugs. He might not have literal power of life and death over people, but having them fired kills their influence. The Rev knows you don't ask someone for power. You bargain for it, you demand it, you take it. But you don't get it by simply asking those people actively wielding their power over you. What could Cheech have done, really? Resigned in protest? Where is he going to get money, sex, and drugs? In the next scene, the Rev introduces the white guy to the boxing world. In this scene, we see how he influences the media. In return for his bribe, Cheech made Terry the number eight contender, and the Rev calls him the honorable, estimable, incorruptible president of World Boxing International, Mr. Julio Escobar. He doesn't just make him sound better. He uses the opposite of the truth. Just like the Ministry of Defense is really the Ministry of War, or National Socialism is viciously anti-socialist, or the Congo Free State was a giant slave plantation, propagandists use opposites and fabrications to mold public perceptions. Controlling one's image requires controlling the message, and only admit admitting being wrong if it benefits you strategically. Part of being in power, therefore, means somehow avoiding answering the tough questions. We've all heard politicians do it, attacking the interlocutor's character, for example, or saying, that's not the question. The real question is... This is how you deal with questions. If you have nothing to say, say nothing. Better still, have something to say and say it, no matter what they ask. Pay no attention to the question, just make your own statement. And then if they ask the question again, what you say is, that's not the question. Or, I think the real question is, and then you make another statement of your own. <laughs> or, as the Rev says, Truth needs to be shaped and molded and framed, Saul. As the press conference wraps up, someone approaches the Rev and makes an accusation. Julio Escobar is a whore on your payroll. It's true. He is. So how does a powerful person react when confronted with the truth? What did you say? Keep it legal. Did you hear that? That's a libelous statement and a racist comment simply because Julio Escobar is of Latin descent. That's right. Are you saying something about brown-skinned people? Do you hate Jews and Negroes as well? Whoa. Both barrels. Libel. Racism. The Rev turned this man from someone literally speaking truth to power to a liar and a racist in a matter of seconds discrediting him in the eyes of his peers, and shutting up anyone else who might make the same accusation. The character to the, that I think best illustrates how the Rev wields power is Mitchell Kane. In an exemplary performance by Jeff Goldblum, Mitchell Kane is an independent journalist making a documentary to expose the Reverend Sultan. He appears to us several times at the beginning, uh, looking into a camera and narrating his report. It begins... You and I are going to take a very close look at this boxing promoter, this exploiter, embezzler, charlatan, and demagogue. And by the time our journey is over, gentle viewer, I'm going to expose him for what he really is, the devil incarnate. Kane is the only one outside the Rev's inner circle who knows how dangerous he is. Anywhere with a free press is likely to have some radical journalist speaking truth to power, but they 
like Mitchell Kane, go mostly ignored. Kane attempts to blackmail the Reverend Sultan. He forces Sultan to arrange a meeting. But the meeting's not in some coffee shop or even in an office. It's in Sultan's home, on his turf and his terms, in his sauna. He naturally has the advantage. So what do you want? I want to destroy you. <laughs> I want an exclusive interview uh, where you're going to have to finally answer some of the tough questions. Uh, you're a bad guy, man. You're, you're bad. Even Mordell's disgusted, you know, but I'm not going to kiss your feet. Uh, you're a fake. You're a bully. I don't like what you do to Girl Scouts. That is pretty funny, huh? I like you. You have a goal, and you have the balls to reach that goal. You have a blind, stupid belief in yourself. <laughs> Flattery is not going to work. My course is... Oh, no, no, no. I, I want to offer you a job. I heard they're going to do Cops the Musical. Uh, I could be kind of unreal. Well, they did it with the cop rock. Well... You okay, boss? You never more lose it. Turn on the camera. Thank you. Thank you, Hardy. Some have said that this upcoming title fight is built around racism. But is it racism that electrifies people? The Rev co-opted him, appointing him his new PR guy with a nice new salary. As is sometimes the case, the journalist or the academic or the social worker or the more highly skilled union employee likes what the powerful have to offer and sells out. Kane is soon throwing out nonsense like in, a, in, in the cynical age that we live in, it's, uh, it's rare indeed when someone or something becomes so transcendent mm -hmm. as, as Terry and this fight have become. By charming, confusing, threatening, intimidating, and co-opting the people who challenge him, the Reverend Sultan shows us both how power works and why people with power are so hard to dislodge. Of course, the Great White Hype is about the world of boxing, not the coercive power of the state. The power of the state is incalculably more dangerous, and as a result, political power relations are far more competitive and even more lucrative for the winners. So what happens to the Rev? Does he lose his empire? Or does he come out on top? Do you really need to ask? He's the only one in the movie who truly understands power. He's not going anywhere. I 